What are the differences between Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism? Well, on the surface, if you look, there may be quite a bit of similarity. So, for example, we have things like icons. The priests uh, have vestments. We have priests. We have bishops. Uh, both Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy have liturgy, and, and they use incense, and they're very sacramental. Having said all of that, there are some significant differences. I said we all have bishops. Orthodoxy lacks a pope in the sense that Roman Catholicism has a pope. For us Orthodox, every bishop is a successor of St. Peter. And as such, when the Orthodox need to address an issue, if they need to affirm something of the faith, they gather together in a council, a council of bishops, where each bishop is on equal terms, equal footing. Now, one bishop, say a patriarch, for example, might be accounted uh, the first among equals. But for us, that's as far as it goes. We don't have a pope uh, like the Roman Catholics do that has universal and absolute jurisdiction and authority throughout all of Christendom. For us, each bishop exercises his own, um, his own authority and brings that to a council where he is equal with his brother, brother bishops. And when he's back home in his own uh, diocese or archdiocese, he is the one who is, is, is pastoring and shepherding the flock that he's, been, that he's been given. And no other bishop can come and tell him, well, this is how it ought to be. And you ought to change this or you ought to, you ought to do that. This is very interesting. Uh, Pope Gregory, the Diagonist, back in the 600s, I believe, was, was very upset with the ecumenical patriarch in Constantinople because the ecumenical patriarch was calling himself ecumenical patriarch. And Pope Gregory understood that the ecumenical patriarch was trying to make himself a bishop over all of the bishops and said, no, once you do that, you cease to have bishops. You only have one bishop, and that's a, that's a problem. You can't call yourself ecumenical and try to exercise universal and absolute uh, authority over all of the other bishops. Now, truth be told, that is not what the ecumenical patriarch was doing at that time. But St. Gregory slightly misunderstood what was happening. But he made the point, the correct point, that you cannot have a bishop who has authority over all of the, all of the other bishops. If you do that, you cease to have bishops. You only have one, you only have one bishop. So, and that's from the Pope of Rome. So it was very interesting. A another major difference. In Orthodoxy, we don't have created grace like you find in Roman Catholicism. For us, when you receive the grace of God, it's not as though you're receiving some sort of special gift or, or some sort of a favor. What you're actually receiving is the very life of God the very life of God, his life. He, he's, he's not giving you some sort of created grace and then saying, here, here's something special for you. He's saying, no, this is my very life that I'm giving to you, that you're participating in, that you're sharing in. So that's a major difference. Another thing that orthodoxy lacks is an idea of purgatory that you find in Roman Catholicism. We don't have purgatory. Another thing is how we understand the life of clergy. I'm a priest and I'm married. In Roman Catholicism, virtually 
all of the priests are celibate, and that's more or less the requirement. In Orthodoxy, we have celibate clergy. They are either priests who never married, or they're monastics. For us, you can be a married priest so long as you're married prior to your ordination. Once you're ordained, there's no going and getting married. We don't want our priests dating. We don't want to get involved in any um, inappropriate power dynamics with parishioners or have parishioners view the priest as somebody who's on the market uh, and things like that. It would be also very odd for a priest to hear the confession of someone that was interested in dating him. So you know, think about that in, in, in practical terms. Um, but, but theologically speaking, for, for us Orthodox, there's nothing wrong with, with being married. Of course, many of the apostles themselves were. St. Peter, for example, was, was married. Another major difference, we have saints, we have relics, we have icons, and, and we venerate these people. We venerate their, their relics, we venerate their icons. And of course, the greatest of all of the saints, for us, and probably for Roman Catholics too, is the Mother of God, Mary, the Theotokos. But one of the major differences is that Roman Catholics have this understanding of the Immaculate Conception, where Mary was born without original sin. This is not something that Orthodox Christians understand or, or accept. But, but the reason why Roman Catholics have this understanding of the Immaculate Conception is, is, is this. Mary has to be born without original sin because um, Christ can't have original sin. In, in, in Catholicism, original sin is something that is, is inherited through uh, propagating children, through having children, and, and, and it's passed down from, from parents to, to their children. So if Mary has original sin and, and shares in the guilt of Adam, then the child who is born of her, Christ, would have original sin and he would share in the, in the guilt of Adam. Um, and, and, and the way that, that Catholicism deals with this problem, because you can't have Christ who has the original sin and has the guilt of Adam, is to make sure that uh, Mary is immaculately conceived, that she doesn't have original sin, that she doesn't share in the guilt of Adam, and therefore her offspring, Christ, doesn't share in the guilt of Adam. So this might clue you into another difference, and that is the, the, the difference between um, Catholicism and Orthodoxy when it comes to original sin. In Roman Catholicism, you have this idea that original sin is passed on from parents to children, and, and you share in the, in, the, in the guilt of Adam. Adam ate of the fruit, and you share in that, in that guilt. For us as Orthodox Christians, we understand that you're born into a world that is affected by the sin of Adam. You're born into a, a, a fallen world, and because of that, uh, you're susceptible yourself to sinning. Uh, of course, even without the world being fallen, obviously Adam and Eve were susceptible to sinning. But you're, you're born into this world, and, and it's through your own sin that you become, you become guilty. So for us, uh, Christ was born without sin, and he maintained a life without sin. And the Immaculate Conception is not required for that to, to be the case. Lastly, I don't know quite how to put this, um, but it seems as though Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism have a different, a different character, a different ethos, a different feel. So you, you, can, you can talk uh, all day long about, um, well, uh, purgatory, uh, or, or, the, or the Pope, or the Immaculate Conception, original sin, or the Filioque, you know, for example. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, there seems to be this, um, this difference in, in, in what we might call it in Orthodoxy, a difference in phronema, a, a difference of, of mind, or, or of spirit, or, or, or of will. Uh, and maybe that is a, a result probably is, 
uh, of all of the other differences that, that, that I've mentioned, and then some. But if you attend an Orthodox service, and you, you, you compare that to, to a Roman Catholicism or a Roman Catholic service, you'll certainly see that there is this difference in ethos, this difference in character. Um, and that counts for something. That means, that means something. So we have a different mindset, a different spirit. And that's what sets the two churches apart, I would say.